section sixteen of our search for a wilderness by mary blair b b this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight the water trail from georgetown to aremu we allowed ourselves only forty-eight hours in georgetown to unpack our specimens and prepare for our second expedition into the bush this time we were to leave the coast and strike straight inland passing up the essequibo river to bartica thence via the mazaruni and cayuni to the aremu and the little aremu rivers near the headwaters of this last stream was the gold mine which marked our journey's end deep within the wilderness on the morning of march twenty third we left georgetown on one of sprouston's steamers en route for bartica a pair of gray-breasted martins accompanied us and we found that they were nesting in an angle between two beams of the main deck covering young birds were in the nest so the martins must have accompanied the steamer on many of the alternate day trips between georgetown and bartica not only this but the river boat exchanges routes every two weeks with her sister steamer which is plying on the outside northwest route to morahana the fortnightly change from fresh to salt water doing away with all the need for keel cleaning so these birds had started their nest while the boat was making her sea trips during much of the time we were in the boats the birds kept flying out to each side over the water in pursuit of insects for their brood they sometimes went far ahead or out of sight a half mile to shore after entering the wide estuary mouth of the essequibo we passed leguan and hog islands each over ten miles in length while above these a succession of smaller islands appeared the river is about three miles in width fringed with mangroves and we saw no life on shore save occasional kokoi herons feeding on the flats the essequibo is the largest river in the colony and arises in the extreme south somewhere in the akarai mountains near the equator some six hundred miles inland like all the great rivers of this region it is navigable by steamers for only a short distance rapids and cataracts barring the way about fifty miles above the mouth the first great tributary is the mazaruni entering from the southwest and touching with its uttermost headwaters the very base of that mysterious lofty plateau roraima on the borders of brazil we landed at the very apex of the point of land between the essequibo and mazaruni rivers the village of bartica or bartica grove it is a most dilapidated place half in ruins a single street of miserable houses filled with blacks and coolies we were invited to spend the night at the house of an englishman mr withers enjoying again the unfailing hospitality of the wilderness in a launch we proceeded three miles up the mazaruni and climbing a steep hill denuded of its forest we turned and reveled in the magnificent view a small heavily wooded island in the foreground broke the surface of the shining waters and beyond the two mighty rivers rolled ceaselessly joining their floods with hardly a ripple directly across on the opposite shore of the mazaruni the picturesque white buildings of the penal colony could be seen looking more like hotels and cottages of some watering place than like prisons if one must be imprisoned for life there are few places one would prefer to this an american company had obtained a concession of some seven thousand acres for the purpose of raising sisal hemp and mr withers was in charge of this important undertaking his home on the crest of the hill overlooked the surrounding rolling country six hundred acres of which had already been cleared during the preceding nine months and planted to this valuable fiber plant 
here again we found a most ingenious system of catch crops peanuts castor beans and corn surrounding but not interfering with the slower growing sisal their success was yet to be proven a careful study of the effect on animal and plant life of this clearing away of the forest would yield much of interest many sloths with young were caught when the trees were being felled and gold birds wood hewers parrots and other forest birds had now retired some distance from the clearing the antlers of two deer shot here were simple spikes insects of all kinds had greatly increased and caterpillars of strange shapes and colors were legion in number and doing their best to undo the labor of the agriculturists insect eating birds of certain types had increased enormously and gray-breasted martins barn and variegated swallows filled the air while kiskadee tyrants of three species other flycatchers house wrens seed eaters hummingbirds and honey creepers were abundant swooping over the open fields snatching insects from the air or leaves or ground according to the method of hunting of each species the honey creepers were continually getting into trouble here as elsewhere in the darkened upper roof space of the house and many had to be caught and liberated daily small snakes and toads are also said to have increased due doubtless to the increase of insect food but the abundance of agoutis or akuris was unfortunately only too evidently due to the supply of succulent vegetables this evening the regular afternoon wind continued until late and it was too cool to walk without a coat the wind sounded anything but tropical howling around the eaves of the house like a northern blizzard the moon rose about nine o'clock a great flat-sided ball of orange lighting up the pale bare fields but throwing all the jungle into blackest shadow soon the light became stronger and the two southern crosses paled from view the false one higher up kite-like and the vera cruz low and resting on its side Sproustons is a company which controls many of the steamer and launch lines of the colony and gives remarkably good as well as reasonable service when the day comes that the tourist learns of the beauties of this country the transportation lines will become of immense value now they depend principally on the many american concessions and other interests for freight and upon pork knockers and bovianders for passengers at nine o'clock on the following morning traveling again on one of sproston's launches we left mr withers and proceeded up the mazaruni in about an hour reaching the point of its confluence with the cuyuni this was as beautiful as the junction of the essequibo and the mazaruni which we had left turning up the cuyuni we went on and on through a region of indescribable beauty the noble river spreads out in a wide smooth expanse a tropical hudson with palisades of trees it is very shallow and when the water is low there is little but tide at this point hence mangroves are dominant becoming however smaller and less numerous as we proceeded at eleven o'clock we reached the beautiful falls at lower camaria landing and went ashore to find a delicious breakfast prepared for us by the genial and hospitable mr french and served by his aged manservant who was christened swan but who was familiarly known throughout the colony as french's boy at camaria a series of all but impassable rapids and falls occurs and a portage of three and a half miles is necessary a well-made sandy wagon trail points the way rising gradually and then slowly descending again at the top of the rise the sand is of the finest and whitest quality butterflies were extremely abundant along this wood road a dozen splendid blue morphos being sometimes in sight at once 
one interesting species of butterfly castina lycus was very common flying along ahead of us with short spurts and alighting on bare twigs just within the shadow of the jungle they were dark brownish above tinted with dull orange and green and with four broad streaks of white across the wings they were perfectly protected in the positions of rest which they chose on small bare twigs the brown merging invisibly with the dark recesses of the undergrowth beyond while the white markings exactly simulated a white orchid blossom sprouting as so many of them do from a leafless stem as the mule cart passed laden with our luggage we seized the graflex camera and secured the accompanying photograph in spite of their protective colors and mode of resting the wings of almost all had been nipped by birds and we saw one fall a victim to a flycatcher the characteristic birds of this trail were swallow-tailed kites and yellow-bellied trogons the former soaring overhead every few minutes and the latter dashing from cluster to cluster of berries in the middle of the afternoon our walk brought us to upper camaria where we were again on the bank of the cuyuni here tied to a gigantic mora tree a second launch awaited us and from here to our second night's stopping place at matope we stopped only once at tiger island to take a few pork knockers on board although there were only three small hut-like houses here there was the invariable colony of yellow-backed caciques the tide was blocked by the succession of falls and rapids and so at upper camaria the whole character of the vegetation was changed mangroves had vanished and in their place were mucka mucka and other aquatic growths backed by the solid walls of trees and vines snake birds were perched in solitary state at frequent intervals along the banks silent sinister looking craning their necks out at us and either dropping quietly into the water and sinking from view or flapping heavily upward ordinarily their flight is very pelican like six or eight flaps then a short scale but when they once reach a high altitude they soar most gracefully with set wings first in a wide slow circle then with a sudden straight rush then a circle and so on all apparently without a single wing beat when thus high in air they have a most peculiar arrow-shaped appearance thin sharp beak slender neck and body and broad fan-shaped tail while the launch was puffing slowly along we saw one of the most unexpected sights of the trip a fresh-water flying fish carnagilia strigatus it did not leave the surface entirely but skimmed steadily along in a straight line with the tip of the deep keel of the abdomen just cutting the surface it was small not more than two inches long and of the greatest interest to us at that time as we did not then know that such a thing as a fresh water flying fish existed to see a silvery little form break from the mirror-like surface of the river and go skimming off through the air left us amazed these fish were silvery in color marked with irregular black markings with long wing-like pectoral fins and a remarkably deep keel like the keel of a racing yacht as we went on the walls of foliage became higher and more dense stretching up far up above our heads until the topmost branches were from one hundred to one hundred and twenty-five feet above the water majestic vistas opened out ahead of us and now and then great solid banks of flowers hung like huge tapestries upon the foliage walls one white flower with a plume-like tuft of long slender stamens filled whole bends of the river with its sweet perfume and formed aerial banks of bloom 
fifty feet square we saw here for the first time the green river ibises looking dull black in the sunlight they were of the same size as scarlet ibises but with a shorter tail and flapped more slowly in flight just before dusk we reached the house of the government agent of this district mr nicholson and were made welcome at his little home in the heart of the wilderness the house is on a steep bluff of red clay changing to yellow near the water and commanding a fine view up and down the river below the river is smooth and shining while a quarter of a mile above the house a mass of tumbling white water blocks further progress and marks the second portage in the yard near the house one passes through a cluster of young fruit trees and here two small colonies of yellow-backed caciques had located clustering their pendant nests almost within arm's reach about two big nests of stinging ants at dusk several hundred smooth-billed anise dropped into a clump of bamboo and with much racket and squabbling settled for the night this region is wholly undisturbed the few pork knockers and indians who pass keeping entirely to the river mr nicholson told us that capybaras hydrochorus capybara came every night and raided the vegetable garden and we had good evidence of this pushing through the bush a short distance downstream at dusk we saw a small herd of these creatures appear and distribute themselves over the banks some waded along the shallows or swam out and dived to come up with a mouthful of algae others climbed the clay slope and disappeared into the jungle they seemed like reincarnations of some of the great unwieldy prehistoric beasts restorations of those bones by which alone we know of their existence in past ages it was too dark to photograph these giant rodents but by the kindness of dr bingham we are able to show several splendid photographs of capybaras taken in their haunts the indian hunter at matope finds abundance of game within a mile of the house two kinds of deer tapir peccary and of course curassows and guans trumpeters are often heard from the house but are considered too tough for food we talked chiefly by signs with the arawak indian hunter who had just come in with a bush hog or peccary dicotales tajaku as soon as the animal is killed the gland on the lower back is cut out a piece of skin being removed about four by eight inches if this is not done immediately the flesh will become musky and unfit to eat the hunter was familiar with the rare white-lipped peccary dicotales labiatus which he described as larger than the common kind and going in small families of two to five individuals this was a dangerous animal and more than once he had been treed by them whereas the common peccary was timid and harmless except when wounded or cornered mr nicholson had recently seen a full-grown great ant-eater myrmecophagia jubata swimming the river and curiously enough we later witnessed a similar performance where the banks were about a third of a mile apart the creature was making fair headway although drifting rapidly and was completely immersed save for the elongated snout and head and the upper part of the bushy tail which waggled frantically with the efforts the ant-eater was making mr nicholson promised to obtain some live trumpeters for us and later kept his word by sending one to new york a few months after we left there are gold diggings near here which were worked by the dutch in sixteen twenty five in the earlier days of the english occupancy gold smuggling was an everyday occurrence at bartica and mr nicholson had to take extraordinary precautions to guard against it he would scrape a line under the keel of a boat from stem to stern by this means often discovering hidden bags of gold 
many a coopful of innocent-looking fowls brought down by the pork knockers were slain by the government inspectors and found to have their crops and gizzards filled with the precious yellow grain cartridges were a favorite means of smuggling the powder being removed and replaced with gold there is no longer any attempt at smuggling now as it does not pay vampires desmodus rufus are so abundant at matope that every evening one of the servants collects the chair cushions on the veranda and packs them under an upturned chair otherwise the dogs bitten while sleeping on these cushions would ruin them with their blood we swung our hammocks on the veranda and kept one light burning and although the bats squeaked shrilly throughout the night none of us were bitten early next morning we packed up and set out and in a few minutes a launch landed us at the foot of the falls this portage was only about a hundred yards in length bringing us to perseverance landing here were several tent boats most of them filled with pork knockers we stored our luggage in the one reserved for us and climbed into a tent ballyhoo with ten paddlers in addition to the bowmen and steersmen all big powerful piratical looking blacks except the steersman who was an indian now came the most exciting part of our trip passing up the series of rapids which filled the whole bed of the river it took us until noon to pass them a smooth expanse of water would indicate depth sufficient to float a steamer then a bar of granite would appear rising on shore into huge boulders and forming a series of foaming tumbling waves across the river in such a place there were numerous small islands and the width increased greatly while the water everywhere was shallow with channels ramifying here and there as we approached one of these rapids the bowmen stood up and the men braced themselves for the tremendous exertion starting with a slow steady stroke this became quicker and quicker as the white water was reached then the bowman using his long paddle lever-like against the thwart held the ballyhoo steady while the men drove her through the swirling water the current became stronger and stronger the canoe seemed to slow down be stationary even to slide back a foot or two then the great black backs glistening with perspiration would twist and bend in a final effort and the boat would shoot forward into the quiet eddy at the foot of the rapid with the water swirling past on each side now at a word from the steersman the blacks tumbled overboard hastily getting out heavy rope cables which one or two of the most powerful took in their teeth or tied around their waists and carried to some projecting rock as far ahead as possible after they had fought their way up the rock they tied the rope securely and now all hands took hold some of the rope others of the boat and pushed and pulled her up through the boiling torrent in one or two cases it was possible to zigzag up through the less formidable shallows after a particularly difficult piece of paddling we would rest in some backwater for a few minutes and have time to look about us every snag held its complement of vampires which took to wing only when we were very close solitary sandpipers and paruques were abundant the latter apparently nesting on the numerous little sandbars and swooping near the boat or swinging up to a bare branch where they perched lengthwise and watched us with half-shut eyes the rocky islets were covered with the low water guava pisidium fluvatile and the rocks which are usually covered with shallow water or those within reach of the falls were studded with thousands of little starry flowers in other places masses of delicate pink blossoms raised their heads above the shining mat of green submerged leaves which fairly carpeted the pools 
the beds of pink green and white amid the pools reminded us strongly of the many-colored sponges hydroids and anemones in the tidal pool of the bay of fundy or a reef off a florida key these aquatic flowers far out from shore gave forth a sweet perfume attracting flies bees and even butterflies which flitted through the mist just clearing the foaming water now and then small reddish-brown crocodiles were seen sunning themselves on the sandbars one not more than three feet in length paid no attention to the revolver shots which threw up the water close to him the little flying fish became more numerous as we went on skimming here and there in the smooth pools twice we saw one dash at an insect once a large bee and the second time a butterfly but they were less successful in their insect hunting than the swallows both the banded and the variegated which swooped across our bow whenever we went close to a bank we saw multitudes of a new flower with its graceful rebarbed stamens looking like the falling lines of sparks from a rocket we lunched to-day on a splendid outcropping of rock on the left bank after chasing into the cracks some big and remarkably colored tarantulas with light red bodies and dark legs end of section sixteen section seventeen of our search for a wilderness by mary blair Beebe. this librivox recording is in the public domain one of the most delightful surprises on this trip was the boat songs of the blacks how we wished afterwards that we had written down the words and music at the time one melody remains clear in our memory the words of the songs were delightful one never-ending refrain imparted the original and thrilling information that a long time ago is a very long time another song was the stevedore's shanty then all would break out in a wild harmony that city hotel is the place where i dwell fare thee well fare thee well my city hotel my city hotel my city hotel the one of which we never tired was all about selina my dear and we made the men sing it over and over until they were breathless like all negroes they were full of spirits and childish humor their paddling was splendid but terribly wasteful of strength as at the end of each stroke they gave a strong upward jerk sending a shower of drops into the air our luggage ballyhoo was sometimes abreast of us across the river and when the sunlight was reflected from the eight circles of water thrown into the air at each stroke the sight was a beautiful one when we returned several weeks later the shooting of these rapids was as exciting as had been the ascent there was no slow difficulty paddling or dragging up of the ballyhoo but a swift shooting downward giving fleeting views of tall walls of verdure innumerable islets great smooth-faced rocks around which our canoe slid perilously close her keel sometimes scraping the algae on the bottom we shot here and there from side to side of the river back and forth guided by the stolid-faced indian in the bow now and then we would turn completely around in order to keep to a deep channel which bent on itself at an acute angle then a moment's breathing in slack water before the men gave way again either to hold back with all their might or to put every ounce of strength into their work to keep the boat steady in her course as we ran parallel to a double line of seething trembling waves to enter which would have been instant destruction we would pass by a half dozen smooth looking false channels to enter the single safe one perhaps far across under the lee of the opposite shore a pilot not acquainted with every foot of the way would have overturned us instantly 
the indian would head our bow into the roughest part of the water apparently in sheer foolhardiness but always the waves broke under us and tossed us like a chip over the jagged rocks a cross current in the maelstrom would tear our bow out of its course and at a cry from the steersman all ten backs would bend as one and fairly lift the boat back into her course as before macaws shrieked overhead kokoi herons stood watching us like statues and the little flying fish rose from our bow and ploughed their furrows to right and left but all passed as a swiftly moving kaleidoscope as instantaneous sidelights upon the great white tumbling mass of water which ever boiled and surged about us at noon on the day of our ascent we entered the big aremu river a side tributary of the cuyuni not more than a hundred feet wide and an hour later we grounded at aremu landing here we said good-bye to sproston's launch and paddlers and from here on were transported by mr wilshire's own men and boats we slung our hammocks that night in an open-work thatched and wattled house the company's storehouse after a delicious swim in the cool water no insects came about the vampire discouraging lantern at night and no evening choruses of birds were heard except a family of red-billed toucans the iridescent rough-backed green beetles known to jewelry makers as brazilian beetles mesomphalia discors were abundant on a vine near the house as on our former expedition on the rivers of the northwest we found that as the streams became smaller their interest increased the cuyuni is awe-inspiring and grand beyond words but the banks of the aremu closing in little by little as we ascended brought us into more intimate contact with the creatures of jungle and forest we started up the stream in an open ballyhoo of smaller size at first with paddles but changing to poles when the water became shallower snags or tacubas as is the more euphonious native name became abundant and sometimes stretched far out over our heads flying fish skimmed in all directions and vampires desmodus rufus in scores flew from the dead branches projecting from the water they choose a small sized one say two inches in diameter and alight one below the other with heads raised watching us like little animated sundials they revolve on their perches as the sun passes over keeping the wood between them and the bright light many of the snags had bits of dead leaves and other debris clinging to them brought down and lodged by the last freshet and it was not until we almost put our hand on them and the bats flew that we could tell whether we were looking at a cluster of vampires or dead leaves there were hundreds throughout the course of the river so it is a widespread diurnal roosting habit of these fierce little creatures the blacks in this part of the country call the vampires dr blairs after a certain colonial doctor of the olden times whose favorite method of treatment was bloodletting swallows in the early morning filled the air above the river with a cloud of rapidly moving forms orchids in full bloom were abundant long shoots of golden showers the sweet epidendrum odoratum and many others unknown to us all drenched with dew and filling the river canyon with fragrance three species of kingfishers and big yellow-bellied trogons appeared now and then the trees were taller than any we had yet seen many of the morris and kumacus being much over a hundred feet from base to top at noon we stopped for breakfast in a primeval forest with rather thin underbrush many small scarab beetles canthon semiopacus were resting in the hollows of leaves with their branched antennae raised waiting apparently for some hint of an odor 
which should summon them to their mission of life the depositing of their eggs in decaying flesh spinning through the aisles made by the giant columns of tree trunks were curious translucent pinwheels and not until we captured one in the butterfly net did we realize we were looking at the same attenuated forest dragonflies mesistocaster species which had deceived us so completely five years ago in mexico the movement of the long narrow wings with the spot of white at the tips was to the eye a circular revolving whirl with a needle-sized body trailing behind the white spots revolved rapidly while the rest of the wings became a mere gray haze these weird creatures apparently so ethereal and fragile were hunting for spiders and their method was regular and methodical from under leaves or from the heart of widespread webs good-sized spiders were snatched a momentary juggling with the strong legs a single nip and the spider minus its abdomen dropped to the mold while the dragonfly alighted and sucked the juices of its victim if we drew near one of these spiders on its web it instantly darted away sliding down a silken cable to the ground or dashing into some crevice but the approach of the hovering dragonfly although rather deliberate was unheeded the spider remaining quiet until snatched from its place on a tiny jungle creek we alarmed several large blunt-nosed brown lizards with low dorsal crests which ran up into the branches to escape us in this respect they differed from the big iguanas which always dropped with a resounding splash into the water at our approach near some wild plum trees whose fruit was ripe we found tracks of deer agoutis and some of the smaller cats the fruit was yellow and oblong in shape with a large stone and tasted the way a tonka bean smells bitter and yet sweet a strange concentrated essence of the tropics which excited one in that it differed so completely from the taste of any other fruit morphos became more abundant from this point on some were wholly iridescent blue above a blinding flashing mirror of azure others were crossed by a broad band of black while in a third species the blue was reduced to a narrow bar down the center of the wing great yellow swallow-tailed butterflies and exquisite smaller ones flew about us the crocodiles of the aremu were all small none over three feet and were all black in color as we went on we were impressed with the amount of work which had been necessary to open up this river for the passage of ballyhoos laden with mine machinery six months ago it had been impassable except for small indian canoes and these had often to be dragged ashore and around obstructions now the little channel had been opened and although for the most part completely overhung with interlacing vines and branches yet our ballyhoo wound in and out around the tacubas with but little hindrance the cost of opening it had been more than fifteen thousand dollars huge tree trunks had to be sawn through but even then the wood of many species having greater specific gravity than water the trunks would sink to the bottom like stones offering a greater obstruction than before dynamite was then used to clear them from the bottom of the stream in the early afternoon a beautiful dull red passion flower on a climbing vine became common and we found that its fruit was edible and called by the natives simitu although apparently so much at home here this plant known as the water lemon passiflora laurifolia is really an escape from cultivation the river twisted and turned in every direction and the banks were four to eight feet in height with sloping bars of sand on the inside bends palms were rather scarce their place in appearance at least being taken by the tall slender 
Congo pump trees with deeply serrated rosettes of leaves. Tree ferns appeared in ever-increasing numbers and stretched their graceful fronds from the banks far out over our heads. During midday, silence filled these river glades, both birds and insects resting quietly in the heat, and the only sound was the regular scraping of the poles against the sides of the ballyhoo. The heat was not oppressive except in the glaring sunshine on the water, but such exposure was rare in these deeply forested recesses. We had had no rain thus far, and the temperature of the mornings and evenings was delightfully cool. At night we could scarcely keep warm, rolled in a hammock in a thick blanket. Unpleasant insects were entirely absent, and yet we were traveling in the heart of a tropical wilderness which most of us have pictured as a sizzling, steaming hothouse, teeming with venomous reptiles and stinging bugs of all descriptions. About three o'clock the gold birds began calling, and some other species with a single loud whistle. A cormorant rose with heavy wing beats ahead of us, and when we flushed it the second time, we shot it. It was the little Guiana cormorant, only twenty-eight inches in length, with eyes of dull green. A deer broke away from the bank at the sound of the shot and dashed off. That night we made camp in the jungle. A skeleton shelter roof of poles was thrown up, over which was stretched a tarpaulin, coming to within six or seven feet of the ground all around. Then a double row of stout stakes was driven into the leaf mold along each side, and the hammocks slung from them. They were springy, and one swung not only sideways, but with a slight end-for-end end motion that made every movement easy. While we were making camp, we were hailed by a passing ballyhoo, the occupant of which proved to be Mr. Fowler, the head of the Colony Department of Lands and Mines, who had been at the mine on a tour of inspection and was now on his way back to Georgetown. Hospitable Mrs. Wilshire at once invited him to come over from his camping place further downstream and dine with us a dinner party in the bush we all shared the feeling of festivity the men hastily constructed a table of the trunks of young saplings while the rest of the party hung lighted lanterns from the overhanging branches directly in front of the camp was a tall straight copa tree draped with long hanging bush ropes dangling from the lowest branches, seventy or eighty feet up the trunk. The base sent out thin, far-reaching buttresses, the intervals between which formed natural seats and closets for our guns and bags. Mr. Fowler's Indian hunter brought in several curassows, which we added to the cormorant for dinner. Mr. Fowler had seen a bushmaster, Lachesis mutus, a few hundred yards upstream the first poisonous snake of which we had heard on this trip. We had a merry dinner, Mr. Fowler telling us many an interesting story of his early days in the colony. The jungle around our camp was alive with sound all night. Frogs chiefly, the wing-beating fellows, the heavily loaded freight engines, the bleating calves, and a new kind which raised its loud and continuous voice in choking roars. One's imagination pictured death struggles between man-like monkeys and other creatures. The qualities of human and bestial voices were so blended in this utterance. Vampires flew about back and forth under our shelter, but none bit us. So strange and wonderful was this night in the bush that for many hours sleep was impossible. Early next morning a light rain fell for an hour and through it we photographed our night's camp. As the sun shone dimly through the mist, a chorus arose, wood hewers, parrots, macaws, and in the distance the ever-thrilling moan of the red baboons. The last black pushed off with his pole about eight o'clock, and we settled ourselves for our last day of river travel. 
the stream became narrower and more diversified in places not more than twenty-five feet from bank to bank then spreading out to twice that width with strange keel-like sharp rocks projecting from its surface we elbowed our way through a perfect maze of dovetailed tacubas and slanting tree trunks which we went around or rubbed along or scraped over sometimes we all had to crouch flat down to the level of the gunwale to pass under a low trunk or again even to climb out on to the log and down into the ballyhoo on the other side now and then a pole would be wrenched from a negro's hand as the current or impetus of the boat twisted it to one side or the man himself would be flicked overboard amid roars of laughter from his mates who when he climbed dripping on board again would inquire the cause for the sudden desertion of his post these tacubas which are really fallen trees are the most apparent danger in the jungle although the chances of accident from them are very slight along the bank were many slanting trees bound sooner or later to give way on our return journey down the aremu we passed or rather scraped under a huge trunk which completely spanned the creek it must have fallen about two days before and we had to push through a perfect tangle of orchids and lianas tree ferns twelve feet high draped the banks spiders of weird shapes dropped upon us buoyed up by their long silken cables brush-tipped aerial roots dangling at the ends of plummet lines fifty feet long were drawn from stem to stern of the boat and across the pages of our journals as we wrote half an hour after starting we discovered a three-toed sloth cholepus high up in a tree almost over the water mr howell shot the creature and we found it to be of large size with long reddish-brown hair the face expressionless as it always is in these animals had small eyes of a warm hazel color later we had it cooked and found it quite palatable in many of these tropical growths the new or first leaf shoots are pale or brilliant red this holding good in the case of the giant moras several trees with locust-like foliage and even the flat leaf vines monstera or shingle plants crawling up the trunks one small tree with entire leaves and covered with sweet-scented tassel-shaped flowers had at least half its foliage of a pale yellow green this is the spring of this region in so far as such a region of never-ending warmth and moisture may be said to have a spring on every hand flowers were in abundance all were unknown to us but most were of large size and varied odor and color all the tales of the rarity of flowers in the tropics had not fitted in with our experiences in the course of three bends of the river during some fifteen minutes observation we observed the following in masses of sufficient size to catch the eye far off and add a decided color tone to the spot where they grew purple pea blooms in wisteria like bunches falling star white flowers pink two-petaled ground flowers in dense clumps spider lilies the large kind red passion flowers white tubular blooms five-parted purple star-shaped flowers wild cotton in enormous masses of bloom resembling clematis and as fragrant long thin racemes of very fragrant dull greenish-white flowers brush-like purple blooms white at the base growing sessile on the trunks with an edible fruit which the blacks call wyca this list is exclusive of all the many inconspicuous flowers and all orchids which were seldom out of sight its value lies only in giving the faintest of hints of the wonderful beauty of these jungle water trails on these upper reaches of the stream the two water birds most in evidence were tiger bitterns and great rufous kingfishers 
one could write pages trying to describe a single vista of this beautiful region and yet give only a hint of its charm in one place a mighty loop of a mighty bush rope or monkey ladder with ornate woody frills decorating the edges hangs swaying high in air across the stream several other giant vines have caught hold and have wormed their way in serpentine folds along the first great swing in the spaces between these huge living cables seeds and parasitic plants have taken root and grown filling up the network with their aerial bulbs and in turn furnishing root holds for an innumerable variety of flowers ferns orchids mosses and lichens the mosses are long and fan-shaped like some species of coral and the lichens are red pink gray and white the whole forms high over our heads an enormous hanging garden which no human ingenuity could duplicate two hours after starting we reached the place called two mouths and turned into the little aremu in no place is this stream more than twenty-five feet wide with low sloping sandy or clay banks facing steep ones first on the right then on the left side according to the bend of the stream and the force of the current as we went along a splendid male crested curassow flew up and was shot to be added to our menu before we came in sight it was clucking softly a splash around a bend and sharp claw and toe marks showed where a capybara hydrochorus capybara had just entered the water and from here on we found such tracks common on every sandy bank we were amused at our steersman's occasional orders to the crew in places where the current was swift and poling was very difficult he would shout in a most woeful and despairing voice oh lord giving us quite a start we eventually found that he was intending this ejaculation for pole hard black-shelled mollusks were common on submerged logs and on the banks above the water line were scores of curious spiders and insects while dragonflies of a half dozen or more species darted swiftly about throughout the morning we were never out of hearing of the hammering of woodpeckers or the cooing of doves or the laughing descending scales of wood hewers the chinese music of the cicadas came to our ears a sound which recalled vividly the forests of venezuela the water was now at a medium level but after heavy rains when it is high all the great tacubas six feet above our heads are submerged and much of the land along the river banks becomes a swamp further upstream when the water became very shallow and the stream narrowed to twelve or fifteen feet some of us left the ballyhoo in order to make the work of the blacks easier and took to the trail after a fifteen minutes walk we saw the glimmer of sunshine through the trees and knew that we had reached the gold mine of the little aremu end of section seventeen end of chapter eight the water trail from georgetown to aremu section eighteen of our search for a wilderness by mary blair Beebe. this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine jungle life at aremu some pages from my diary by c william bb even more to the gold mine of aremu than to huri is the application island or oasis in the jungle appropriate the clearing is about twenty acres in extent approximately circular with the magnificent forest trees crowding densely to the very edge the bungalow and mine shaft are on the summit of a symmetrical hill which slopes evenly and steeply down on all sides the hill is about a hundred feet in height and yet the trees far down at the foot tower high above it the concession includes about seven and a half square miles and in many places where the rock outcrops 
well-paying deposits of gold are visible. At Aremu, there is a soft quartz ledge, about eight feet wide, running almost vertically and rich in gold. Often the metal is visible, and a small lens shows the yellow crystals encrusting the white matrix. The first day at Aremu, we went down in the mining bucket, two and two, each clinging to the wire cable and balancing the opposite person. Down and down went the swaying bucket, slowly revolving, the heat and sunshine of the upper air replaced by the cool darkness, damp and chilly, with rich earthen clay smells. Eighty-five feet below the surface, the four leads began, one a hundred feet along the vein. This consists of a ferruginous gold-bearing quartz, somewhat decomposed by the dissolving out of several of its constituents. The candles shed a flickering light on the slimy, dripping walls, and for a few moments one felt completely confused, so hard was it to stand there, shivering, and yet realize that a few yards overhead was brilliant tropical light and sunshine, gaudy birds and butterflies. One seemed in a wholly different world. But, though forever buried in dripping darkness, there were as bright colors here as in the living creatures above ground. Each side of the quartz vein ran an endless series of beautifully stratified, decomposed, talc-like clays, purest white, orange, slate-colored, pink, blue, yellow, and brown, one hue succeeding another like some strange fossil rainbow. Outside, near the bottom of the hill, two gaping holes showed where the blacks who discovered the gold years ago worked the ledge by hand, leaving even in their tailings enough gold to make it well worth working over. Now electric stamps, run by great boilers, do the work, all brought up the little aremu bit by bit with the greatest labor at seasons of high water. Here at Hoori, a few pork knockers were allowed to locate their diminutive claims and glean what superficial metal they could from surface deposits. A mile away to the west was a large outcropping known as England, and here four or five blacks were working. On each Saturday night, they would bring their little packets of gold to the store to receive credit checks or receipts. Once, as we were crouching in the jungle, watching some cushy or parasol ants, two of these black pork knockers passed within a yard without seeing us, each with his little bundle of worldly belongings on his head, topped by a wooden gold pan. I have mentioned panning as the most primitive method of mining, next to which comes the long tom. At England, we found a third advance, a method of breaking up partly decomposed gold-bearing quartz. A deep, narrow pit showed where the material was found, shovelfuls being thrown up on two successive ledges before it reached the surface. It was then carried to an open, thatched roof beneath which was a primitive two-man power stamp. This was nothing but a gigantic hammer made of two logs, the hammer part covered with metal and the handle hung in a socket so that the center of gravity lay toward the head. Two men, balancing themselves by clinging to uprights, stepped in unison on the tip of the handle, their combined weight depressing it and raising the head. Then, stepping off suddenly, the hammer came down with great force on a pile of broken gold quartz fed into a hardened hollow beneath it. This mining enterprise required no less than five men, and they were taking out about a dollar and twenty cents each a day. Comparing the division of labor among men with that among cells, we may liken the single pork knocker to an amoeba where a single man and a single cell perform all the necessary functions. The long tom with two men is like the simpler sponges, where one set of cells secretes the skeleton of spicules giving shape to the whole, and another set 
lashes the water and absorbs the tiny bits of food. The crusher, with its five men, each performing his individual labor, corresponds to some slightly higher organism, a jellyfish or anemone, while the electrically run stamps, employing several score of men, is like the complex cell machinery of a beetle or butterfly. The Aremu mine clearing had been in existence only about six months, and the trees which were felled had been sawed up or burnt so that there was no such abundance of wood-loving insects as at Huri. At night a few longicorn beetles would appear and buzz about, but almost no moths. In fact, during our whole stay only one moth of large size was seen. One small species of moth, with wings of general rusty red, a light line along the front margin, and spreading only an inch, appeared in numbers on the evening of April 2nd. The following day we saw many of the gray rumped swifts snatching them from the bushes in the clearing. I brought a single specimen back and found it was a species new to science, which has been named Copnotes albicosta. Walking sticks and mantises were more abundant. Some of the former had well-developed wings on which they whirred about the bungalow. Others had none at all, or reduced to a scale-like vestige. In an individual of a third group, the wings, while perfect, were pitiful affairs, mere mockeries of pinions, barely an inch in extent, while the body of the insect was almost five inches in length. When thrown into the air, the poor stick expanded his wings to the fullest, but wholly in vain. There was just sufficient spread of wing to act as a parachute and allow him to scale safely to the ground. We watched him several days and never tired of his peculiar walk, swaying from side to side. Often when at rest, the front pair of legs would be extended parallel with the antennae along the anterior line of the body, making the imitation twig eight inches over all. As we walked through the jungle wood roads close to the clearing, large forest dragonflies, small tiger beetles, Odontochilla confusa, Odontochilla cayennesis, and Odontochilla lacordariae, and a few yellow spotted heliconias were the most noticeable insects. One or two of the giant metallic buprested beetles, Euchroma goliath, were sure to be seen flying about the fallen trees, and our Indian hunter invariably made a dash at them, and as invariably missed the active, alert creatures. Passing by a great mora stump in the clearing, our attention was attracted one day by a large caterpillar hanging, dangling about two feet from the ground, squirming and wriggling vigorously. We ran up and saw a most interesting sight. Through a hole about three-quarters of an inch in diameter protruded one of the claws of a good-sized scorpion. These villainous pincers had a secure grip on two of the long head spines of the caterpillar, which was dangling helplessly. As the latter wriggled, the scorpion made attempt after attempt to draw its victim inside the hole, a most absurd thing as from tip to tip of spines the caterpillar measured almost two inches across. After watching this tableau, I caught the scorpion's claw in a pair of pliers, drew him out, and Milady holding him up with the caterpillar, I photographed them together. The caterpillar was a most gorgeous creature, pale green, fading into yellowish at the posterior edge of each segment while the movable joints were dark brown. On the seven posterior segments there were six rows of branched spines, the stalks pale orange and the branches pale blue, the three colors green, orange, and blue making a most harmonious combination. On the anterior five segments there were two additional rows of spines, small ones, low down on the sides. The eight spines on the head segment 
pointed forward projecting beyond the head the largest spines were on the second third and caudal segment and were over three quarters of an inch all the blue branchlets ended in a dark tiny needle point and they stung like nettles as we found when we accidentally touched some i had never heard of a contest between two such creatures and should think the scorpion must have been hard put to it for food to make frantic attempts to secure such a prickly mouthful south of the bungalow scrubby bush had been allowed to grow up and here was a scattering of non-forest birds three pairs of silver-beaked tanagers and a pair of seed eaters gray rumped swifts coursed over the clearing and toucans macaws and orange-headed vultures were occasionally seen from the bungalow while a pair of splendid red-crested woodpeckers hammered the trunks and leaped from tree to tree all through the day in the clearing itself we saw little of mammalian life although we dined daily on all the bush meat from bush pig to akuri the whitened bones of an ocelot lay in perfect arrangement at the edge of the clearing fifty yards from the bungalow picked clean by ants but for some unaccountable reason untouched by vultures the animal had been shot at night chicken stealing at daybreak the red howlers came to the edge of the clearing and awakened us from our slumbers by their wonderfully weird chant jaguars were not seen or heard except one reported by the mail carrier who runs between aremu and perseverance landing some years ago an indian near here found a litter of jaguar cubs containing two normally colored and one black individual the latter was purchased by a colonist and sent to the london zoo a dull colored harmless snake four feet long with two rows of keeled scales along the back was the only serpent we found in or near the clearing lizards were everywhere and one very large iguana inhabited a bit of wood road but evaded all our efforts to add him to our mess pot the amphibians alone in this region would well repay months of study our brief visit gave us only a glimpse of them the commonest frog in the jungle near the clearing was a medium-sized dark-bodied one dendrobates trivitatus with green legs and two pale green bands one running around the front edge of the head back over the eyes and down the sides of the body the second line being beneath the first the under parts were covered with blue lines and mottlings the first half dozen seen were normal in appearance but then one was encountered which instantly drew my attention a closer look showed that the back of the animal was covered with a solid mass of living tadpoles each over half an inch in length when i urged him into a jar two tadpoles were scraped off and wriggled vigorously when put into water they sank to the bottom and made no attempt to swim although the tail fins were well developed and there was as yet no trace of limbs i kept this frog in a box with wet earth and a puddle of water and two days later half the tadpoles had left his back and were swimming strongly in the muddy water they were attached to the back of their parent only by their sucking discs and the object of the strange association seemed only temporary and not intended to last until the tadpoles became adult they would probably drop off and swim away one by one when their father entered some forest pool this species of frog was very active and capable of remarkably long jumps as i shall mention later the sharp eyes of my indian hunter spied a most remarkable frog in the jungle one day which i brought home in my pocket its scheme of protective form and color was perfect the hue of dried leaves and withered mosses with deeply serrated sides and a high irregular ridge over each eye i placed it among some dried leaves and tried to focus on it with my graphlex but could not find it 
then i stooped down and although the fog had not moved and i knew the square yard within which it was resting it took me a full minute before i located it and optically disentangled it from its surroundings i have never seen such a case of complete dissolution and disappearance when i alarmed it the frog closed its eyes thus obliterating the dark spots of his irides and then little by little opened them again every evening at half past five o'clock we would troop down to the stream and swim and paddle about on the sandbars in the half day half moonlight the water was cool and refreshing and the temperature of the air invigorating at this hour and to lie on one's back and look up at the lofty moras and other trees stretching their branches fifty yards or more overhead was a sensation never to be forgotten we spent ten days at the aremu mine and it speaks well for the working possibilities of this region that i was able to rise at five o'clock in the morning and with intervals only for meals keep up steady work exploring photographing and skinning until ten o'clock at night when usually the last skin would be rolled up or the last note written i would then tumble happy and dead tired into bed and know nothing until the low signal of our indian hunter summoned me in the dusk of the following morning i worked harder than i ought to have done even in our northern countries and yet felt no ill effects what impressed me chiefly in regard to the birds of this region was first the abundance and second the great variety in the course of the ten days of our stay we identified eighty species of birds and observed at least a full two hundred more which we were unable to classify except as to family or genus wishing to study the birds alive i refrained from shooting as much as possible and chose to make this expedition rather one of preparation in learning what tropical woodcraft i could from an excellent indian hunter than of gathering a collection and thereby a lengthy list of mere names when some time in the future we return to this splendid field of study and spend months in careful observation of some such limited region we may hope to add something of real value to our knowledge of the ecology of these most interesting forms of tropical life we have the results of the collector par excellence in our museum cases of thousands of tropical bird skins now let us learn something of the environment and life history of the living birds themselves it is against my rule to write in diary form but owing to the limited time we spent at aremu and the series of events some of which extended over two or three days i have made an exception in this case and will put down a few of the incidents of jungle life in the order in which i observed them far from giving all the observations made here on birds and other creatures i have included only those of greatest interest which will convey an idea of the conditions of life here as compared to those in our northern woods and forests march twenty eighth leaving the house before noon i crossed the little aremu by a footbridge at the western edge of the clearing the stream here flows gently and smoothly it is from one to four feet deep and ten to fifteen feet wide following it upstream one is stopped within a few yards by a perfect tangle and maze of interlocked vines and trunks showing what it was like lower down before the hand of man hewed and blasted a free channel the forest about the mine clearing is probably near the extreme even of tropical growth one feels absolutely dwarfed as one gazes up far up at the lofty branches where birds like tiny insects are flying about in a world by themselves the trunks are clean hard and straight as marble columns and the undergrowth is thin giving access in almost any direction 
yet dense enough to harbor many species of birds and animals. Turning south along a wood road, I started on my first tramp into the jungle. It was the hottest part of the day, but there was all the difference in the world between sun and shade, and here in the recesses of the forest it was pleasantly cool, and birds and insects were abundant. One of the first sounds which came to my ears was a loud, intermittent rustling among the dried leaves, marked now and then by a low grunt. Crawling up quietly behind a great mossy log, I peered over and was surprised to find that I had been stalking a huge tortoise. I certainly might reasonably have expected to see a mammal instead of a reptile, as our tortoises of the north are not in the habit of attracting our attention by their vocal efforts. This was a South American tortoise, Testudo tabulata, of the largest size, not far from two feet in length, and he was busy rooting in the ground for some small nuts which had fallen in great quantities from the tree overhead and settled among the debris of the leaf mold. The shell of the tortoise was high and arched, dark brown in color, with a bright yellow center in each shield. There were two deep abrasions on the shell apparently caused by the teeth of some carnivore. These tortoises were very common, and we had many delicious soups and stews made of their meat. They were, however, heavy and awkward to carry, and we never bothered to bring them home unless on the return journey and near the clearing. In one individual we found eight eggs about to be deposited. My wood road led up a gentle incline down which logs had been skidded, and after a half mile it merged gradually into the jungle. At the last sign of the axe I sat down on a fallen trunk and quietly waited. Three blue honey creepers, two males and one female, dashed here and there in the branches close overhead. They uttered sharp cheeps until the males flew at each other and began fighting furiously. Ascending for fifty feet in a whirling spiral of hazy blue and black, and then clinching and falling to earth, where they clung together claw to claw and pecked viciously, and in silence their beautiful plumage disheveled and broken. The lady, heartless cause of all this terrible strife, cheeped in low tones overhead and nonchalantly plucked invisible dainties from the undersides of leaves. I took a step toward the combatants, and they separated and vanished the lady, be it noted, following swiftly in their wake. Close upon this melodrama came a fairy mannequin, black with a conspicuous white chin. I never saw another, and cannot identify it, distinctly marked though it was. Through the forest came the low belling of green caciques, then no sound save the drowsy hum of insects high overhead. The most frequent noise came from falling leaves, twigs, and branches. Yes, leaves, for gently as a falling leaf in this tropical world might mean, like the stroke of a sledgehammer. The realization comes again as a yellow leaf eddies past my seat that autumn is distributed throughout the whole year, while the freshly opening pink and reddish shoots on every hand show that spring is never absent. I observed something circling about in an opening to my left, and on examining it found a peculiar flat cake-like wasp nest with the solitary pair of owners, Polybia species, on the rim. It was attached to the extremity of a long slender bush thread dangling from a great distance above. There was not a breath of air and the secret of the circling motion, the nest moving irregularly in an ellipse of about ten feet, was not solved until, with my glasses, I made out a small monkey, a marmoset apparently, clinging to a branch near where the bush thread started. The little creature had found some store of food in a hollow or crevice of the bark. To get his hand in, 
he was compelled to push aside the dangling curtain of aerial root threads and this occasional motion was enough to send the end far below sailing around in a large circle as i resumed my seat a great beetle like a polished emerald alighted close beside me not heavy and blundering like a june bug or scarab but nervous flicking its wings wasp-like ready at an instant's alarm to whir away as swiftly as light a beautifully marked longicorn beetle buzzed past and alighted ten feet up a sapling leaving me eyeing it enviously a tremble with all my boyhood's collecting ardor heliconias sailed slowly past and one of the beautiful transparent jungle butterflies alighted at my feet with only a few dots of azure revealing the position of the wings white and yellow butterflies floated high in air where a hundred kinds of flowers flashed out among the green foliage lizards were abundant in this little clearing slipping along fallen trees with sudden rushes and halts or tearing madly after each other with loud rustlings through the fallen leaves some were beautifully colored splashed with blue orange and green while other dark ones had a network of delicate light lines crossing the back cutting the creature up into likenesses of small lichened leaves when the sun shone out brightly two or three minute midges danced before my eyes otherwise i was free from the insect scourges of the tropics end of section eighteen Section 19 of Our Search for a Wilderness by Mary Blair Beebe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The trees on this and all later days constantly drew from us exclamations of delight. They were magnificent, awe-inspiring, and if I could think of any stronger word of appreciation, I should apply it at once to them their immensity and apparent age made one reflect upon the transiency of animal and human existence even the long-lived parrots and macaws perching on their branches seemed like mayflies of a day compared with these giants of the jungle which had watched century after century pass as i looked at the circle of trees bordering the clearing a clearing which itself was the result of the felling of only one such giant the great variety of trees was at once noticeable near relatives brothers and sisters or fathers and sons could not exist within each other's shadow so it was that a dozen kinds were visible from my seat one splendid fellow sent up a perfectly rounded grayish column one hundred and fifty feet or more propped with a single great fox-colored buttress sweeping gracefully out from the weaker side of the ground hold of the trunk like the train of a court lady's dress another column was round but deeply fluted the trunk being rimmed with a succession of scallops while in a third tree known as paddlewood this was carried to an extreme the trunk being little more than the point of juncture of a dozen thin blade-like sheets of wood the whole was of a beautiful leaden gray color the moras were the biggest and tallest trees within sight and sent out huge buttresses twenty feet in all directions with space between them for a good-sized room the impression of security was perfect it seemed as if the strongest of winds could never overcome such a reinforced structure hearing near at hand the strange cicada whirr which we have described in a previous chapter i watched for the insect and soon traced the sound to a very large cicada high up on the trunk of a tree wishing to identify it and lacking other means of getting it i backed away some distance and brought it down with a twenty-two caliber shot cartridge 
it is a remarkable country indeed where one goes gunning for bugs and not only this but i only winged my game one pellet of lead breaking the main vein of the right wing bringing the insect to the ground where it buzzed and flopped about until i caught and chloroformed it it was a beautiful species almost three inches in length with transparent wings marbled with wavy black markings and with the thorax and abdomen ornamented with tufts of golden and brown hair cicada grossa keeping to the left through the open underbrush i intersected another wood road then swung around and at last entered the clearing from the southeast hearing a rustling i suspected another tortoise and was about to pass on when i saw leaves and twigs flying into the air behind a log creeping from tree to tree i saw that the commotion was made by a trio of ant thrushes or as i prefer to call them ant birds they took the leaves and leaf mold in their beaks and threw them over their backs all three working side by side covering a width of about two feet they were woodcock ant birds reminding one in the general tone of coloration of the upper parts of that bird the chin and throat were black bordered with white which extended up the sides of the neck and forward over the eyes the tail was short and often held erect over the back while the strong legs and feet proclaimed them terrestrial rather than arboreal when flying or excited a row of white spots flashed out from all the wing feathers save the first two primaries but when the wings were closed only buff markings were visible now and then two of the birds would spy some morsel of food at the same instant and a tussle would ensue with angry scolding cries the two contestants would strike at each other with their beaks with wings widespread and the elongated feathers of the back raised and parted exposing the conspicuous white base of the plumes almost like a rosette these white stars were very conspicuous amid the dark shadows of the forest floor vanishing instantly when the wings were lowered this color was not visible in flight many of the species of this group of birds have a similar concealed dorsal spot and it must serve some definite purpose when the matter of dispute was devoured or had crawled away into safety the quarrel was at once forgotten and the birds began scratching peacefully side by side as before a short distance beyond i encountered what i found later was the most common assemblage of birds to be found in this region a flock of ant birds and wood hewers with a few other species such as flycatchers and tanagers one could not take even a short walk in the forest hereabouts without observing several such flocks numbering from a dozen to fifty or more individuals the ant birds comprise a family formidicaridae of which more than two hundred and fifty species are known they are rather generalized passerine birds which are found only in the tropical forests of northern south america inconspicuous in color and retiring in habits it is only when one becomes familiar with these tropical jungles that one realizes how numerous these birds really are their notes are usually uttered only at intervals and are often difficult to locate they creep silently among the lower branches or as we have seen search the ground for the insects which form their food the name ant thrush is rather a misnomer for they are not thrushes and while they are always attendant upon the swarms of hunting ants yet they seldom feed upon the ants themselves but on the insects stirred up by the ferocious insects we know but little about the nesting habits of these birds and we were unable to locate a nest during our brief stay 
although we knew that several were breeding near the clearing like most other tropical families ant birds have been compelled by competition to specialize and we find some shrike-like in habits as well as appearance others resembling the long-legged pitas of the east indies while the majority parallel wrens warblers or thrushes the woodhewers of the well-named family dentocolaptidae or tree chiselers form with the ant birds a considerable percentage of the smaller forest birds of this region there are not far from three hundred forms of these birds all of dull colors rufous or brown tones prevailing woodhewers in the main parallel the woodpeckers and especially the brown creepers in their method of obtaining food their claws and feet are strong the legs short and the tail feathers in the majority of species are stiff and spine-like they hitch up the trunks of trees finding their food in the chinks and the crevices of bark but not boring into the wood like woodpeckers while the stiff tails show that all have probably descended from tree creeping ancestors some wood hewers have deserted the trunks and have become warbler like in haunt and habit such a one is the cinnamon spine tail or rooty in the tropical forest however wood hewers differ but little in their method of locomotion and one or more of these fox colored birds hitching up a great trunk is one of the commonest sights there is remarkable adaptiveness in the bills some being stout and blunt others long and curved the notes of these birds are with the calls of the toucans and cotingas among those most frequently heard in the early morning especially the sweet descending scales of single notes from various parts of the forest forms a feature which is seldom lacking just before i reached the clearing i flushed two labas or pacas coelogenus paca which ran squealing almost from under my feet these are rodents looking like giant guinea pigs about two feet in length with brown fur spotted with white their flesh is the most delicate of all the bush meat Mr. Howell followed my tracks later in the afternoon and brought home a tamandua or lesser anteater, tamandua tetradactyla, which he shot in a tree. This creature is rather sloth-like in color and in development of its claws, but its tail is prehensile, and nothing more unlike could be imagined than the heads of the two animals, that of the sloth short, round, and blunt the ant-eaters long slim and pointed march twenty ninth we had an excellent illustration this morning of how easily one can get a totally wrong idea of the animal and bird life of a tropical forest nine of us started out along a faint trail used by black pork knockers which after several miles of twisting and turning led to an outcropping of gold known as england all on mr wilshire's concession throughout the whole tramp although we lagged behind we noted not a single bird or animal of interest save for a scattering of toucans and parrots every living creature fled before us or remained hidden one might thus tramp across a continent and report the tropics to be barren of life except in the treetops not only this but the few birds which flew over or were otherwise seen momentarily were without exception brilliantly colored and this would help to sustain the widespread impression that tropical birds are invariably of bright plumage which is very untrue there are really more dull colored than brilliant birds in the tropics at last i slip aside let my companions go on and make a detour to the left of the trail here in the heart of the jungle i discover an overgrown clearing with the skeleton of a hut in the centre 
the ruin itself is a thing of exquisite beauty the half decayed uprights and roof saplings being interlaced and overhung with vines the brilliant scarlet poppy-like passion flowers crowning all from the blossoms comes a busy hum of insects in sharp contrast to the silence of the trail along which we have come in the virgin forest there is ever sharp contrast brilliant bits of sunlight alternate with blackest shadow deathly silence is broken by the ear-piercing call of the gold bird the dull earthy smell of the mold is suddenly permeated by the rare sweet incense of some blossom or the penetrating musk of an animal or some huge emipterous insect in a clearing even a deserted one like this and only a few yards in extent all is toned down the odors are diffused and difficult to analyze the droning of bees alternates only with the sharper whirr of a hummingbird's wings either the brown white eyebrowed one or the beauty with long sweeping tail the rufous breasted hummingbirds are abundant here and have quite a sweet song a trill of twelve or fifteen notes slow at first but rapidly increasing and ascending the half-hidden framework of the hut with the collapsed shelf and table tell of man's past presence so do the pawpaw sugar-cane and banana run riot and suddenly we hear the sweet rollicking song of a little house wren man's follower filling the deserted glade with sweetness probably hoping that soon he will return and reclaim this fast vanishing oasis for when the trees and vines already reaching up over the pawpaw and bananas close densely in as they surely will the jungle will become sovereign again and then the pair of tiny birds will flee not for them are the dark silences the tall sombre trunks their jubilant little souls crave light and companionship many of the birds of the tropical jungle have sweet single notes and calls but most have harsh primitive voices all are characterized by a solemnity or plaintiveness of tone and none that i can recall have the joyful theme which fills the song of this little pioneer from more civilized regions a song which is out of place away from mankind their sweetness has touched the heart of the native guianans who call these wrens god birds it is nine o'clock cloudy and cool and i am sitting near the old hut and write on a trunk fallen across the trail a shuffling of feet comes to my ears and soon a good-sized opossum but smaller than ours of the north trots swiftly toward me not until he gets within arm's reach does he realize that something is wrong i sit as immovable as stone and he puts a grimy little hand on the very edge of this journal his nose works furiously his rat-like beady eyes fairly bulge then he turns just as i grab at his tail but his hind claws scratch my arm so severely that i lose him and he flees back on his trail rolling awkwardly along but making remarkably good time he was probably on his way home after an early morning's hunt thus the jungle folk have already begun to close in on this deserted clearing an hour later as i am kneeling quietly some six feet from the log busy liberating a beautiful little butterfly from the tangle of a spider's web i am surprised to see the same opossum trot past i know him because he has a kink in one ear to see what the little fellow would do i leap toward him but he has encountered me once and come to no harm so he will not be turned back again instead of dodging me the opossum only increases his speed crosses the log drops out of sight among the bushes snorts twice to himself 
and is swallowed up forever by the dark jungle this log is apparently his regular highway and he chooses to risk my apparently fierce onslaught and to run over the opened journal bag hat and gun rather than change to a new path along another tree trunk a few feet further along the trail we mortals sometimes have faint hints of coming events and as i was leaving the clearing i instinctively kept all my senses on the alert i had proceeded only a few yards into the jungle when some of the sweetest flute-like notes i have ever heard came from a patch of underbrush ahead what could it be i knew that no human could whistle like that and when they were repeated i realized how coarse any flute would sound in comparison nothing in this world but a bird could utter such wonderful notes my memory recalled descriptions of the quadrille bird and i knew i was at last listening to it our northern ravines have their hermit thrush the canyons of mexico are transfigured by the melody of the solitaire and here in the deepest darkest jungles in the world arises the spirit of the forest in song the hymn of the necklaced jungle wren dropping everything which would impede my progress i crawled slowly and silently over the soft mold until i was close to the patch of thick brush then i waited and prayed and the gods of the naturalist were good and a little brown form flitted up to a low branch and from the feathered throat came the incomparable tones of the fairy flute the bird sang a phrase one of six to ten notes at a time this was repeated several times when an entirely new theme number two was begun which was given only once then a third and fourth were tried each note was distinct and of the sweetest most silvery character imaginable in all but two phrases the invariable end consisted of two notes exactly an octave apart the last like an ethereal harmonic twice the tones were loud and penetrating twice they came so faintly that one's ear could hardly disentangle them from the silence birds with scale-like songs are far from uncommon in the north the field sparrow in mexico the canyon wren here the wood hewers but this was wholly new phrase after phrase each differing from the preceding how i longed for a phonograph i scrawled a staff on a bit of paper and pin-pricked the notes where they seemed to come and reproduce them here but what a parody they are be they whistled or played necklaced jungle wren or quadrille bird as the natives know it is a true wren barely four inches in length brown above with a black collar spangled with white the face throat and breast are rich rufous with the lower parts pale brown this is the singer the song no man may describe a small deer sprang up at my left and i had walked some distance in that direction when i suddenly realized that i had missed the trail and had been following an imaginary opening through the jungle on closer examination this proved to be a deer trail leading to a small spring of clear water i will never forget the first thought of terror at being lost in this endless forest in one direction a few miles away lay the bungalow in the opposite direction one might wander for weeks without meeting even an indian as this thought came 
i espied a little scarab beetle resting in the hollow of a leaf who as i looked climbed slowly to the rim wiggled his antenna and took to wing what a wonderful power of scent it was which was directing him straight as a magnet to some far distant bit of decaying flesh and with what marvellous vision the vulture high overhead spied me and hung for a moment watching me through a break in the foliage how dull and inefficient seemed all my organs of sense in such a crisis as this for a few moments i devoted myself to discovering which way was north and from which direction i had come the cloudy sky and the sameness of all the vistas through the jungle completely foiled me and i had to give it up and ignominiously unravel my puzzle deliberately and unromantically i stuck my long-handled butterfly net in the ground and began to describe circles about it widening them gradually until on the third round i intersected the trail and went on my way the danger of being lost is by no means an imaginary one and even with a compass it is sometimes difficult to retrace one's tracks the indians themselves have to guard against becoming confused when in a new region before i reached the main trail and met the returning party i saw a number of the exquisite white-capped mannequins clad in shining black save for their snowy caps their flight unlike their white-breasted cousins which we met in venezuela was noiseless they were far from silent however twanging their little vocal cords in an apology for a song a wheezy grasshopper-like buzz the females were silent somber little beings dull olive green above with a grayish cap and paler below after lunch at one o'clock in the afternoon i started out again and climbed to the summit of a densely forested hill southeast of the mine clearing the treetops were filled with birds and not for a moment was i entirely out of sight or sound of one or more species a few yards from the clearing i followed up an excited cackling and found a pair of splendid red-crested woodpeckers they had a nest in a tall dead stub and were trying to dislodge an iguana which was steadily crawling up a neighboring branch a moment after i came into sight one of them struck the lizard with its wings whereupon the iguana reared up and lunged with open mouth the birds then ceasing their attack upon the inoffensive saurian what splendid birds the woodpeckers are strong active full of vitality and enthusiasm over life these were big fellows black above variegated on shoulders and head with white thickly barred below and with a long crest of blazing scarlet they spent much of their time near the bungalow and when they drummed steadily their scarlet head plumes seemed a living flaming haze near the summit of the hill a tall silver bali had been felled and sawed by hand into boards this had made a small clearing like the one i visited yesterday the trees were filled with many species of birds attracted by the abundant insect life some of which i knew and made notes upon while most were unknown to me a group of tiny feathered beings was busy catching midges near the top of one of the highest trees their sharp cheeps coming faintly down to me hopeless of ever observing them at close range i secured one and found it to be a buff-tailed tarantlet this waif of the upper air was less than three and a half inches in length with rather unusual coloring the forepart of the body gray and back wings lower breast and tail rufous its claim to the flycatcher family was proved by the broad beak and remarkably long bristles one must have an aeroplane or more practically an observing station in the treetops 
to study these and a hundred other interesting birds at close range with a couple of hundred spikes as a ladder i intend some day to make one of these mighty trees give up many of its secrets as i was about to seat myself on the ground beyond the clearing a big guan or maroodie as we learned to call it here arose with a loud cackling cry and a rush of wings simultaneously a dark colored animal slipped into a hole freshly excavated some twenty feet away i lay prone waiting for some other unexpected manifestation of life but all was quiet then i prepared to watch for the reappearance of the unknown burrowing creature and pressed my face close among the ferns where i could just see the entrance a minute passed and directly across my line of vision a few inches away from my face crawled as rapidly as it could move a very large caterpillar almost four inches in length never have i seen a more remarkable looking one its ground color was a peculiar dark wine red or purple like the plumage of the pompadour cotinga from the sides of the back projected brush-like tufts of red and black hair while a continuous line of dense golden hair extended out from the body just above the feet over six segments was drawn a pale yellow pattern of the most delicate lace-like markings a dainty network different on each segment altogether it was a wondrous creature and entirely put the burrowing mammal out of mind i carried it to our improvised laboratory on the veranda of the bungalow but it refused food of all description and day by day became smaller in size and duller in color instead of dying it transformed one night into a large beautiful chrysalid yellow-green with a pale bloom over the surface it was an inch and a half in length thick set in the center and tapering rapidly the joint between the fifth and sixth segments was hinged and the terminal portion would swing vigorously from side to side the spiracle on the sixth segment was cream colored and much longer than the others while the bottom of the chrysalid ended in two short brownish spines seventeen days later in georgetown a beautiful orange shaded morpho butterfly emerged i looked it up in a curious old volume the insects of surinam by madame merriam written many years ago and found it was a rare insect morpho metellus light orange on the forewings shading toward the body into pale green and on the hinder wings to velvety black from tip to tip it spread six inches on this tramp i heard at least a dozen unusually loud or musical calls and whistles new to me which i could not trace to their authors in one case however i was successful creeping up to a low thick patch of brush a splendid scarlet bird flew out and alighted twenty yards away again giving utterance to its characteristic loud whistle today i was contented with listening and watching but later i secured the bird as i could not otherwise identify it it was what i have christened the black-headed scarlet grosbeak differing from the description of this species in being eight and three eighths inches instead of seven and one half inches in length it was scarlet below dull red above with a scarlet necklace and jet black head and throat a yellowish female showed herself for only a moment the whistle was loud and penetrating but sweet in quality the first theme had three distinct phrases which may be represented thus the second consisted of three scales the first ascending one being more abrupt than the succeeding ones thus when the first bird ceased 
another took up the whistle as long as i remained near the place what splendid birds these would be in an aviary striking both in color and notes the nest eggs and young as is the case with so many south american birds are unknown gold birds were calling all through the woods and when one paid close attention considerable variation was apparent in their notes one individual uttered the hui hui oh twice in quick succession with the two introductory phrases only before the first call this was repeated three times and then the bird reverted to the usual single utterance on my way home two agoutis sprang up before me and i secured one for the general mess end of section nineteen